We're going to deal with uh, the social contract, and I'm going to be focusing most primarily on Rousseau today. Um, I'm going to do this by t text, so I'm going to read with a little bit of ad-libbing in, in between, but I'm not an improvisational type, so uh, it's going to be that type of lecture. So, The modern social contract tradition in many ways starts with Thomas Hobbes in the late 17th century. Its purpose is to try to conceive of the relationship between state and citizen as a kind of agreement and the minimal necessary conditions that would create a legitimate foundation for political authority. That's how can we construct a state that we can all accept and agree upon, right? While Hobbes' notion of the state and its lopsided empowerment of, of state over citizen may seem difficult to accept from our critical and contemporary perspectives, his logic nonetheless embarrasses our complaints by its abundance in our present day world. Vari variations of authoritarianism, much as we've discussed in class, have become in many ways the norm. John Locke's ideas of the state and the God-given notion of property to which he entrusts it, on the other hand, has seemed to many to be a far more equitable and just balancing of the interests of public and private power, the individual or groups and, and the on the one hand and, st and the state on the other. Indeed, his thought is entrenched in the American Constitution and has, up until, up and until the present, had a tremendous influence on mainstream thinking that calls itself liberal in the belief that rights, capacities, and, proper, and the property of the individual are the sacred trust which calls the state forth, which gives the state its right in the first place. While Hobbes' theory of, of the state initiates the idea that citizens are due some measure of right in exchange for duty and obedience, Locke moves in a different direction and regards the primary purposes of power to be the securing of individual liberty, which at its core, in one form or another, is really property holding. While Hobbes to this day holds special prowess in the field of international relations for his understanding of anarch anarchic systems and state actors, um, Locke has a special place of preeminence with political theorists, uh, mostly in the English-speaking world who are liberal. And they are more concerned with the preservation of personal interests and liberty in the face of the incursions of voracious state authority. Where many liberals have pointed to this emphasis on the respect for the individual in their favoring of Locke over Hobbes, and while the debate has had an epic between realists with Hobbes and realpolitik on one side and liberals and Locke on the other, this debate has had an epic influence on the development and split within political theory, political thought uh, between idealists and realists in the English-speaking world. For me yet, yet for me, another voice stands out which I think outshines both of these authors, both of these thinkers. This is the voice of the young Jean-Jacques Rousseau. Unlike Locke and Hobbes, as we'll explore, Rousseau does not seek to read the laws of nature scientifically for political purposes, so much as to show that the modern usage of scientific or other logics or argumentations for politics is first and foremost driven by the aspirations of domination, right? That is, for Rousseau, the truth behind the thought of Hobbes. Could I ask you to put your phone away, please? Thank you. Sorry. Right. That is, for Rousseau, the truth behind the thought of Hobbes and Locke and others like them must be sought in their class allegiances and understanding of the world. Untangling these allegiances, these connections, these relationships, right? They're wasta. To expose the innards of the modern soul is what drives Rousseau. And at, at, and at the same time, anguished him both in his writing and his personal life. With this said, let us begin to consider the former, right, his writings, in his text of 1755, uh, entitled The Origins of Inequality, which we're going to be looking at in class, I assume. Rousseau begins his text by speaking of two kinds of inequality, one physical and one moral. He understands moral inequality as the enjoyment of privileges by some at the expense of others, whether these be in the form of honor, power, or wealth. Rousseau openly rejects the old adage or old saying that natural inequality in the form of physical or intellectual gifts justifies moral, in moral inequality. This, he said, would be crazy and wrong because right, the people in the world that have the power aren't necessarily the most gifted. Having provided us with his basic understanding and his primary concern with moral rather than physical inequality, right, he sets out to retell the story of the history of present day inequality, how we got where we are, and to consider the degree to which progress has been made towards overcoming it in the long development of civilization. Right? 
For Rousseau, Hobbes and Locke varying, varyingly and differingly ascribe the principles of reason, ambition, justice, and property to who we are, to our human nature. But Rousseau thinks they assume too much in doing so. He wonders what le then led these philosophers to make these claims and whether we should really trust in their opinions. His answer is short and blunt. Both of these thinkers and other like, others like them, he argues, speaking continually, continually of need, avarice, right, greed, oppression, desires, and pride have transferred to the state of nature the ideas they acquired in society. They spoke about savage man, and it was civil man they, depict, they depicted. In actuality, their varying versions of human nature, Locke and Hobbes, have much less to do with human, with human nature and our natural origins, and are, for, for Rousseau, a reflection of modern social interests. For Rousseau, these authors have forwarded a vision of an original psychology in society propped up by scientific and, at times, theological arguments which sh fall short of honesty. In fact, for Rousseau, the British social contract theorists presented arguments which, which conceal their true intent. That is, to justify class privilege, status, and the ascendancy of modern market society. Even their use of religion, despite its explicit moral claims, does no more than to command us to believe that since God himself drew man out of the state of nature, they are unequal because he wanted them to be so. Thank you. Thus, for Rousseau, these views need to be left behind in order to grasp the real roots of human nature as oppressed to its perversion in the world we currently know. Right? Inequality should not be accepted as somehow normal. We need to think back to the beginning beyond the philosophical and ideological pretensions and assumptions of the modern world and without assuming that God made nature and inequality as it is. This exploration after our first nature, our original nature, Hobbes, this, sorry, Rousseau dedicates as a hymn, a song, in praise of your first ancestors, our first ancestors. The criticism of your contemporaries, those who, amongst whom we live today, and the dread of those who have the unhappiness of living after you, after us. Right? He's getting very dark here. For Rousseau, we clearly see that our more glory lives in our past, our remote past, which he takes as a counterexample to the dystopia and devolution which modern injustice implies and reproduces. With this, Rousseau has introduced us to his purpose, his plans, and his presumptions. Clearly, he has drawn up some drastic conclusions very early on in the text. We have thus to see how he backs them up. Rousseau takes it that original humans in a state of nature were exceptionally vulnerable in comparison to other animals, slower and weaker than most, and not as well equipped to survive. Yet at the same time, they adapted, we adapted, to, their condi to our conditions in the original state and developed the necessary skills. This is in the state of nature, right, before we lived in civil social arrangements. Under the regime of nature, the human constitution was robust and children, for Rousseau, were largely left to fend for themselves, perhaps after breastfeeding. While the first humans were more than capable of defending themselves from other animals, their primary enemies were old age and illness. Yet death came without concern or worry and was not lamented or mourned. They died as they lived with little anxiety or reflection on the state of things or their own future. In contrast to this ease, the physical and mental maladies of modern living, the torture, one might say, are many. Rousseau's words here bear recalling. The great inequality in manner of living, he's speaking about us now, right? The unwholesome food of the poor, together with excesses of every kind, immoderate transports of every passion, fatigue, mental exhaustion, the innumerable pains and anxieties inseparable from every condition of life. These are two fatal proofs that the greater part of our ills are of our, are of our own making, and that we might have avoided them nearly all by adhering to that simple, uniform, and solitary manner of life which nature prescribed. Here Rousseau asks whether the benefits of civilization outweigh the difficulties of our original condition, the original state of nature. To what extent have all of our industry and efforts to overcome the deficits and injustices of nature through civilization been simply replaced by excesses and ills which for Rousseau may be nothing less than our departure from nature? What has been lost and what gained? Is civilization a worthwhile bargain? Rousseau's conclusions on this question are clear.
In following the history of civil, civil society, of civilization, we should be, shall be telling that also of human sickness. In fact, civilization and domesticity have had far more drastic moral consequences than the mere physical ones, which we sought to eliminate when we first departed nature. We left nature not for moral benefit, but for physical, but as a result, we accrued a variety of what he considers to be very serious moral and spiritual, spiritual consequences. Right? For Rousseau, as humankind became sociable and a slave, he grows weak, timid, and servile. His effeminate way of life totally enervates, drains his strength and courage. Yet what brought about our departure from our original condition of nature? Right? Why did we leave it? What actually pushed us out? For Rousseau, in comparison to other animals, which he considers to be merely ingenious machines dominated by instinct, Humans are different in their capacity or choice of choice or free will. Instinct alone does not direct our actions or our thoughts. We are not machines. Humans thus have some play on instincts, and unlike animals, free will liberates us from me mechanistic causality or determinism. We are creatures of spiritual ends, not merely natural or material. For Rousseau, for Rousseau and in contrast to somebody like Bacon or others in our course, physics might be able to explain the mechanism of the senses and ideas, but in the power of willing, nothing is to be found but acts which are purely spiritual and wholly inexplicable by the laws of mechanism. With this spiritualism and reliance upon intuition, Rousseau departs from the main trend of scientific empiricism, which underlies the political thought of the likes of Hobbes and Locke. For Rousseau, human agency is not reducible to its external or internal environment, and this engenders within us a certain dignity. Beyond free will, humans for Rousseau also share the inherent drive to perfection, to self-improvement, and he called this perfectibility. Unlike animals, this internal evolution of the mind, a spiritual development, means that the humans assimilate knowledge, adapt to conditions, and benefit from development that implies in the end, through history, through development, physical as well as moral, a real change in who we are, in our human nature. Human nature is not permanent. Rousseau foreshadows the consequences of this substitute for instinct. It would be melancholy, it would be sad, were we forced to admit that perfectibility, progress, is the source of all human misfortune. In short, it may be the case that substituting the tree of life with that of knowledge is in fact part and parcel of the basis of Rousseau's critique of modern society in general. He sides with the argument that civilization in the long run does a much poorer job of satisfying human wants and needs, producing yet demanding far more than nature ever wanted, warranted in nature. This incessant activity, as we shall see, has its roots in a crisis of the social and economic foundations of modern life that for Rousseau makes humanity a tyrant, us, a tyrant both over ourselves and over nature. A tyrant, tyrants we are. Behind his language, there is, here is a counter, there is a counter enlightenment, indictment, rejection, right, of reason. That reason itself is merely instrumental, merely domineering, and that in the end its goal is mastery. Mastery first of nature, and then mastery of ourselves, of humanity itself. Under, underlying Rousseau's views then is the critique of domination itself where the mirror of nature, the state of nature in this case, is used as a blank slate into which we moderns may peer to understand just how morally corrupt we've become where we claim virtue, how weak we are where we assume strength, and how deformed we are where we celebrate our normalcy. Perfectibility, this orientation towards progress, the foundations of what the Enlightenment understood as progress it seems, for Rousseau, pulled us away from the peace of nature and tragically into the jaws of the cruel and unjust civil state. And more on that soon. We continue to assume it is progress today, but it's actually a trap. We started with limited instincts, compensated by our mental faculties, which only develop, developed with the onset of experience and very slowly over time. For Rousseau, this process took you know, eons, thousands and thousands, if not tens of thousands of years. On the basis of this understanding of the organic belonging of savage humans to the state of nature, the noble savage, Rousseau declares in retrospect that they had no real reason to leave. After all, it is our natural home. 
while lacking the foreknowledge of the despair, cruelty, and varieties of alienation awaiting them in civil society to keep them stuck in nature. If they had known that this was coming down the road, they would have stayed, though they didn't have this. They also lacked any real impetus to depart from the original condition, with or without that knowledge of what the future was going to bring. For Rousseau, there was certainly neither the anxiety and fear that Hobbes reads into the state of nature, nor the philosophizing reason and interests of Locke to lead them out. In short, these original savages could never have intellectually gotten to the social contract the way Hobbes and Locke imagined, because all the sublime thinking and rationality that they use, that they require to get there, Hobbes and Locke, simply could not have come to pass. Thus, humans are not born philosophers, nor enemies, nor even political animals, as Aristotle would say. In spite of his later work on the social contract, right, there is a later social contract, Rousseau, the young Rousseau insists that the social contract itself is never and cannot be natural. Taking is issue with Hobbes' view of, of the state of nature as solitary, poor, nasty, brutish, and short, it is not humans nor their actions which make this so. It's not us that creates this condition, some evil, some demon within us. For Rousseau, at worst, it is the conditions of nature which made life difficult in the original condition. As Rousseau makes the case, sloth-like humans of the original condition of nature satisfied their hunger at the first oak, slaking his thirst at the first brook, finding his bed at the root of the first tree, with that all of his wants and hers supplied. Savages were thus not unhappy because, unlike us, they were of sound physical constitution and, with, and experienced little anxiety and certainly produced little for themselves. By contrast, the real misery for Rousseau is with us modern neurotics, right? And we'll take a look at what we mean by that. Our whole condition of existence is built up around complaint and fatigue. Too many ideas would have tormented the ones we have, savage humans. Thus, where instincts satisfy the demands of the state of nature, intellect right, and ambition is never enough in, the, in civil society, in the modern world. In fact, the whole glory, honor, and power seeking that Hobbes sees going on in the psyche of the savage is nothing but a reflection of his mo own modern inclinations and worldview of us. For Rousseau, there is no good or evil in the state of nature, and even less a basis for all-out war, as Hobbes imagines, right? The war of all against all. In truth, our unrepressed well-being in nature was the basis of real virtue and happiness, a simplicity and sense of vital satisfaction, vital because it was to a certain extent based on instinct, that we can hardly conceive of in modern life with its status-seeking. Shame and numberless desires. With Hobbes's conservative view of human nature, with this Hobbes's view of conservative human nature is rejected, and Rousseau insists that let us not conclude with Hobbes that because man has no idea of goodness, he must be naturally wicked, that he is vicious because he does not know virtue, right? Ignorance is actually not only a state of bliss, but also a state of peace for Rousseau. In, in direct contract with, contrast with Hobbes, Rousseau implies that the state of nature was in fact an ideal condition to sustain peace between humans. Leaving the state of nature is actually what creates conflict. Hobbes, in contrast, sees, saw the state of nature as a state of war of all against all, because he assumes and assumed that savage humans are like civil ones, like modern ones, greedy, vain, and cruel. Moreover, Hobbes held that modern greed and violence is a direct reflection of our, of our original nature, with, with merely the addition of law to tame and direct it. But for Rousseau, this is not satisfying. And he argues that Hobbes has merely framed a version of the state of nature to naturalize, to justify modern inequality and injustice. Where humans weren't rational in the state of nature, they did not plot against one another. They did not plan to disarm and consume one another. And so did not covet, not des did not desire power over others as Hobbes imagines was everywhere the case. They could also do no moral harm to each other because they had no conce concept of harm, injury or insult, where honor seeking was certainly not the norm. More important than this, more important than this critique of Hobbes and a major contribution of Rousseau, Rousseau psychology here is the position that savages possessed decency, pity, and compassion. They sought only their well-being with the least amount of prejudice towards their fellows. Egoism, and this is of course the savage, the noble savage. <clears throat> 
Egoism and the vanity which Hobbes speaks of, where each seeks in the state of nature the highest rank against all others and judge themselves only against others, is a trait of civil, not natural, humanity. The insult and injury of contempt, which both Hobbes and Locke imagine as a cause of the disorder of the, of the natural state, where we all get insulted and seek revenge against one another, is not found here for Rousseau. The savage lived only within its own concern for self-preservation and without reference, without the vanity of the concern for the gaze, the view of others. Thus, the potential for violence and revenge that so motivates other social contract theorists does not concern Rousseau. It is rather the vanity and honor seeking of the members of civil society, we moderns, and the hierarchies of class society which create the reason, rationality, which shuts off the inner voice, right, the inner voice of conscience, of compassion, from nature, leading it towards a calculus of rational self-interest that declares, perish if you will, I am secure. The calculus, the, the hedonic or the rational calculus of interest that certainly dominates Locke and Hobbes's uh, arguments. The last vestiges of compassion and empathy yet live on in the conscience of the suffering working classes for Rousseau. Not so regimented by reason, they still hear on occasion the promptings of compassion, the heart. That is, thus it is not only science, but class as well, which for Rousseau instructs the decay of civil of modern life. The enlightenment progress of the mind and the cruelties of class society go hand in hand with one another here. In fact, Rousseau goes as far as to claim that it hasn't been reason, right? As many of your teachers will, you know, liberal influenced teachers will want to argue, it hasn't been reason that has preserved human society, but rather what little amount of compassion we still have. By looking back to the original state of, Rousseau, uh, state of nature on Rousseau's account, we can thus only understand the modern extremes, right? of injustice and inequality in terms of the evolution of our social institutions and politics, right? And ultimately market society. With his overview of the state of nature and comparative of civil and pre-civil hum human nature complete, right, his psychology, Rousseau turns to consider the history of the development of inequality, right? Civil society, far from being originated by reason or the laws of nature, is in fact, right, modern civil society, is in fact the result of the first act of appropriation. The first man who, having enclosed a piece of ground, Rousseau says, saying, this is mine, and found people simple enough to believe him, was the real founder of civil society. To arrive at this termination of the natural condition, right, the beginning of the civil world, civil life, civil society, to, to tell this story, Rousseau elaborates a very long development, a very long history, and I'll just simply try to compress it here. The first inklings, the first beginnings of social and civil life start with loose transient collectives based on mutual interests. The surplus of necessities which these relationships, these affiliations provided them allowed leisure time, right, free time. This in turn led to a dependence upon conveniences that reaches its summit in the modern world, right? Not hard to imagine with our reliance upon the iPhone or the Android. This led civil society towards a life of dependency on things and a loss of original liberty. Needs emerged and multiplied, which before were not even wants. And reliance on these conveniences, contra and in contrast with Bacon, led humanity into its current condition. The first yoke, right, the first uh, manacles or chains, he in inadvertently imposed upon himself. And the first source of the evils he prepared for his descendants is property. The social bonding dedicated to production, right, the creation of society around uh, creation of goods and services, or goods, the production of what we need, the necessities of life, led, leads to a division of labor. But this division and the interdependence it implied enriched some and impoverished most. This inequality inherent in the market inevitably affected the lives of individuals who began to sink or to rise with a tide of exchange and accumulation, right? Class emerges. Not merely social, the division of society into classes and rank had direct, not merely social, but psychological implications as well for individual development. Misery, despair, and, and alienation become norms of modern life. For those who sink low on the ladder of power and wealth and where wealth and, and wealth, the ladder of power and wealth, 
There is permanent contempt, right, within society. Unable any longer to provide for ourselves and completely dependent on the judgment of the more powerful for one's own self-consciousness, a terrible economy of respect, of honor, and status emerged that served to destine some to greatness, but most to misery. Rousseau tells us that it now became the interest of men to appear what they really were not. To be and to, to seem became two totally different things. This performance of the self, right? And Rousseau has a major concern with authenticity, finding who we are, right? This is part of Rousseau's modern project. This performance of self makes us into slaves, where the poor can only know and fend for themselves through the power of the wealthy, and even the wealthy become wholly dependent and perhaps fat upon the labor and skills of the poor. This tragic theater of mutual dependency and the unequal playing field upon which it is played out led to an inherent instrumentality right, of relations. What does we mean by this? Humans came to take each other as a means and utility to their own ends. We no longer live for ourselves, but live for ourselves through others. Now, while the savages were no Kantian ethicists, right, and we'll get to the categorical imperative at some point in this course, and certainly did not wither, wit, uh, witness others as autonomous creatures to be respected, yet neither did they seek to take others as things to be exploited as objects to be used. This, however, becomes the norm in civil society for Rousseau and for a great many other authors. Inverting Hobbes' depiction of the abusive and aggressive nature of our original nature, Rousseau reminds us that in civil society, insatiable, right, unsatisfiable ambition, the desire to surpass others, inspired all men with a vile propensity to injure one another, right, sadism and with a secret jealousy which is the more dangerous as it puts on the mask of benevolence, right? We do harm with a smile to ensure that somehow our real interests aren't seen. In short, civil virtue and friendship are really parasitism and competition, civil law really nothing but the domination of class, and civil order becomes the normalization of the power of some through the permanent submission of the many. This state of war, Right? Civil society, not the original state of nature, nature, contra Hobbes, Rousseau tells us was the first effect of property and the inseparable attendant of growing inequality. Out of this, the wealthy, using their old slaves to acquire new, thought of nothing but subduing and enslaving their neighbors. Like ravenous, hungry wolves, which have once tasted human flesh, despise every other food, and then for, thenceforth seek only men to devour, right? We will read the master-slave dialectic later in the class, which later in the, in the semester, some of us will, uh, which really takes us a step forward. In the midst of the chaos of early civil society where property was appropriated only to be stolen by others because there was no state, no, no law, the powerful in, under this condition of the instability of their property gathered together to ally in the name of justice to secure their power and interests. A pact, an agreement, was formed which created the state in the name of the weak and property. In a stroke of con artistry, right, con to cheat and to fool others, the state was created by the social contract in the name, in the name of the defense of virtue and peace, right? With this first act of all ideology or political marketing, the uneducated, unwashed, and desperate enemies of inequality surrendered to power, to power professing justice. They believed that they were actually getting something out of this exchange. On Rousseau's account, the social contract is actually a tragic bargain. All ran, all ran headlong, he tells us, into their chains, in hopes of securing their liberty, which bound new fetters on the poor and gave new powers to the rich. Eternally, it fixed the law of property and inequality and subjected all mankind to perpetual labor, slavery, and wretchedness. Where civil society first set itself up as a just remedy to the instability of the rule of the jungle, the rule of, of nature, it claimed that tame nature, it re had returned to the same only to make permanent and more secure the advantages of the stronger, right? Civilization in its first inklings, its first argument as to why we leave nature for Rousseau is because we need to create justice where the weak, think of Hammurabi, right? The weak are protected from the strong, but in fact, for Rousseau, civil society, justice, and civilization are the permanent, right, is, creates the permanent condition of the submission of the weak to the strong. 
Here then, civilization itself becomes the ordered institutionalization of domination. In fact, his an analysis goes further, for beneath the very layers of inequality, Rousseau sees wealth as the common denominator and class power as its outcome. With such an analysis, Rousseau claims, we are enabled to judge pretty exactly how far a people has departed from its primitive constitution and its progress towards the extreme form of corruption. Right? Kind of reminds me of the genie, right? the genie uh, ratings and rankings. Echoing the work of Karl Marx that was to come a century later, Rousseau tells us that the universal desire for reputation, honors and, advances, and advancement, right, ambition, inflames, excites, and multiplies our passions. By creating universal competition and rivalry among men, numberless failures, successes, and disturbances of all kind by making so many aspirant, aspirants run the same course, right, the rat race. Anticipating Hegel and Karl Marx's thought on alienation and competition by many years, the basic elements of his dense, of Rousseau's dense and rich analysis of the crisis of the modern condition are still the talking points of many of our most respected critical thinkers and public intellectuals. Today, imagine yet how much more difficult it must have been for Rousseau to stand up amongst his Enlightenment peers of the establishment in the way he did. No doubt this in part explains the tortured social, personal life and loneliness and regret uh, which Rousseau experienced for most of his life. The schadenfreude, German term meaning sadistic pleasure, we take from the vulnerability and suffering of others only in comparative relation with our own well-being, for Rousseau is the hallmark of this set of our circumstances. Beyond the image of the master reflected back in the cracked mirror of the suffering slave, the, mas the master has no identity, no value, no happiness. The master needs the slave in order to be who he or she is. With this, Rousseau's cycle of civil society is complete, has come to full circle, and the many are returned to the same rule of the strongest that had been declared as the reason from the departure from nature in the first place. This time, though, they are subject to a far crueler and more merciless master. Let me sum up and conclude here. Five years prior to the publication of the Discourse on the Origin of Inequality, which we are discussing today, in 1755, the young Rousseau unleashed his first assault, five years earlier in 1750, upon enlightenment, science, and reason in his discourse, his first discourse, on the arts and sciences. There, Rousseau argued that the sciences letters and arts spread flowers over the chains which men are burdened, with which men are burdened, stifle in them a sense of original liberty, make them love their slavery, make them into what is called civilized peoples. In both texts, right, the first and second, second discourses, the analysis of the moral and spiritual crisis which the modern sciences, as well as private property, bring about is understood as a fundamental social and political one. Thus, his critical assessment of both the material intellectual progress of the core enlightenment program is really a reflection on the political and economic transformation that drove feudal Europe into political, industrial, and scientific modernity. Behind the seeming wisdom and humanist contributions of science, right, think Rousseau, sorry, think Descartes or Bacon, Rousseau sees aspirations of power and domination over nature as well as social life. Behind the moral and ethical claims of enlightenment reason, he sees the justification of new forms of class power seeking to replace the old only to ensure their monopoly against future competitors. Yet while Rousseau's critical stance would influence a major revolution, the French, the romantic movements in art and literature of the 19th century, and thinker, thinkers right down to the present day, certainly making his impression on modern and contemporary intellectual life secure and beyond question, there is no doubt a variety of ways in which we can take issue with some, we can criticize some of his claims. To be sure, Rousseau's appeal to us is as much to the heart as it is to the head. And while we can agree with the broad strokes of his commentary, his retelling of the development of the history of pre-social humans, right? His story of how we were when we were in that original condition and how we got out of it, bears at least one major rectification, one major correction. It seems unlikely Right? that there was ever a human past that did not include language and communal existence in which we were not somehow social. His notion of hermits, right, 
solitary individual creatures that had no connection with one another. His notion of human hermits in the state of nature, wandering the land and sleeping in trees with merely minor and happenstance encounters with one another seems a little bit indulgently creative and far-fetched. Despite this serious deformity and the fact that such lonely nomadism more likely represents and reflects Rousseau's own social and emotional life, for a lost soul in his day and time and place he was, it does not detract from a larger and more important fact. The por uh, and to conclude, the portrait of the modern soul, which Rousseau, I'm getting some echo here, the portrait of the modern soul, which Rousseau paints against the backdrop of the fictitious past, the state of nature, this fiction he's created, continues to strike home in a devastating way today. Many in the tradition of political philosophy have sought to diminish, to sideline, the stature, the value of Rousseau's early works in la latter of his considered more mature works, his later works from his later life. Nonetheless, many are and continue to be led back to his passionate outcry right, of his earlier works as a therapy for our own personal crises with modern life, as well as a remedy to the fictions of progress, the fiction of progress that is consistently recycled by the powers of the present. With that, I'll thank you for your patience and enjoy your sessions on the social contract. Thank you.